people that take science as if it's just another opinion among, among a bunch of other opinions, as if it's just a matter of a belief. Uh, I, I don't believe in evolution. Oh, really? You don't believe that if you let the big uttered cows reproduce and you don't let the small uttered cows reproduce, there won't be more big uttered cows the next generation. Really? You don't believe in gravity? That means you could probably fly. And that just, it just drives me fucking crazy. Reminds me of an old cartoon I've seen for years and years. It shows a guy standing at a podium. He pushes the button and a bolt of lightning comes down. You see two panels below that. One is the non-scientist who says, shit, I'm not going to do that ever again. And the scientist that goes, huh, I wonder if that will happen again. Now, that's actually really important for science because who knows whether the button really caused the lightning. And if you push the button and nothing happens, you've got a control condition, and that didn't happen. You need to do those comparisons. You need to look at the data. It's not scientific beliefs aren't a matter of faith. Do you not believe in evolution? Believe it. It just it's a, it's about the evidence, and that's just people don't understand that science isn't just a bunch of memorizing of facts, but it's how you get them. Even smart undergraduates, seniors working on their final papers, write a paper like they've got their argument, and they're going to marshal their positive evidence. Okay, they're moving in the right direction. They're talking about evidence anyway. But what happens is you can cherry pick evidence for anything. I'm the second coming of Jesus Christ. I have a beard. I like to wear sandals. My mom thought I was a gift from God. I uh, kissed a girl named Mary on the lips a bunch of times. Um, and you can come up with any number of things, and it's like, I'm sorry, you haven't looked at the possible counter evidence. You haven't looked at the evidence about how, why that might not occur. Any fact, any fact you say is, you can always ask, and this is a really good question to always ask, in comparison to what? I'm, am I tall or short? Well, in comparison to what? When I was in high school and college in Indiana, where all my friends were over six foot tall, blonde Midwesterners, I was the, the short, scruffy looking, you know, guy. When I go to graduate school in Massachusetts, where most of my classmates are Ashkenazim from New York, I'm like the tall, blonde Midwesterner. In comparison to what? It's a great story of a guy on a school board trying to set up a situation where they consider the new math. And he suggests that they assign students by lot to the new math or the old math, and then compare at the end of the semester. And he's denounced by everyone else in the school board. How could you pay a lottery with students' lives? And it's like, no, you dumb shits. Unless you do that, you don't know whether it matters, whether it works, whether it's too expensive, whether it does damage, until you do that comparison. You're just gonna play a lottery with everybody's life instead of with this overall population. Okay. So you're doing comparisons. When I taught students, I tried to make it brutally obvious. So I fight. I say, okay, I want to compare a teaching situation where you've got a um, pure, strict lecture versus um, open discussion. How do you decide which one's better? Well, you do a comparison, obviously. So let's compare a straight lecture class of Minnesota ninth graders studying the influence of Bismarck on the Austrian question of 1849 with teaching with an open discussion method to a bunch of Hawaiian eighth graders studying the history of the hula. And then see which one does better. Well, look, it's stupid. It's obvious. There's a bunch of confounding variables. You got the grade level. You got Minnesota. You got versus Hawaii. You've got the, the subject matter. You got the teachers. I mean, any, those are called confounding variables that might also be what's responsible for the results. People don't fucking get it. It's not that hard of a concept. A confounding variable is not that hard of a concept. So I finally get to the point where it's like, let's make this brutally obvious. Bob and Sally have been in love for years. They've lived together. They both think they love each other. They have a great relationship. And then one day, I mean, Bob's had some trouble with commitment and Sally's getting to be pushing 30. So Sally kind of wants Bob to come around. Well, one day 
Sally wins $6 million in the Pennsylvania lottery. So they go out to celebrate. And Bob says at the end of the dinner, you know, Sally, you know, it just has come to me how much I love you and how much I think that I, you're the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with, so let's get married. Of course, Sally has to say yes then, because if you say no or maybe, you know, that's a bad thing to do. But the next day she comes back and she says, Bob, you know, I put aside $100,000 for our wedding and our honeymoon, but the $5,900,000 I've given to your favorite charity, because I know otherwise we'd spend the rest of our lives wondering. Is the money a confounding variable or not? She'll find out pretty fast with that control condition. The point is, you have to ask, how do you know this? But even better, it's, might you be making a mistake? Might you be wrong? I used to always write on the board my favorite Oliver Cromwell quote, which he said to Parliament, in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you might be mistaken. So I printed up 200 condoms with that on it and had students, if they wanted to, take one because I thought, you look at that condom and maybe that just gives you one little pause of critical thinking before acting. Thanks.